Hello. Welcome. Thanks for joining me. Uh, so the, the topic for this session is Diagrams as Code 2. Who's using Diagrams as Code? Plant UML, Mermaid, that sort of thing. Anybody? A few people, but mostly not. Perfect. So uh, this is mostly around software architecture diagramming. Um, so if you want to move fast as a team in the same direction, you need good communication. So I see lots of organizations who are striving to be lean, who are striving to be agile, but they're not, communic they're not communicating well, and that's slowing them down. So this is really all about good communication. And teams need a ubiquitous language to describe the things that they are building, specifically around things like software architecture. And this is really important if you're doing things like DevOps or DevSecOps, where you want to describe your architecture, describe your solution to lots of different individuals. Some are technical, some are non-technical, of course. In terms of a ubiquitous language, we could use something like UML. But of course, nobody's using UML these days. Who's using UML here? Right, nobody. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why people don't want to use UML these days. And I've literally heard all of them. Uh, nobody knows it. You'll be seen as old or old-fashioned. I've had a bunch of organizations say that to my face. Uh, people think the UML is too detailed. And there is something about the UML notation that kind of draws you in. Uh, it's, very, it's very specific when you start looking at things like arrowheads. And people think that things like UML are not expected in agile environments. What's the answer? What do people suggest these days? Well, they suggest you just go use a whiteboard and the values in the conversation. And although I agree with this and there is some truth here, in reality, comments like just use a whiteboard don't provide enough guidance and structure. So they're kind of not pushing people in the right direction. If you go and do a search on Google for something like software architecture diagram, you'll get stuff like this. And these diagrams look colorful. And you can read the words, and the fonts are legible. But these computer-drawn diagrams have all the same problems that I often see with whiteboard diagrams when I travel around the world and do architecture diagramming workshops. We've got a whole bunch of different shapes and colors, and we don't know why. Unlabeled arrows is a big one, et cetera, et cetera. Since nobody wants to use UML, this is kind of my starting point for some advice. If you are going to use boxes and lines notations, then try to do so with some structure in mind and make sure that your diagrams are somehow self-describing. So I'm the creator of something called the C4 model, uh, not the C4 model that Pratik was talking about a few minutes ago. This is the C4 model for visualizing software architecture. You can find a nice short introduction to C4 at c4model.com. C4 stands for Context, Containers, Components, and Code. And it's four levels of hierarchical architecture diagrams that allow you to tell different stories to different audiences. So the system context diagram. This basically shows your system in the middle and things around it in terms of people, so actors, roles, personas, and other system dependencies that you have. And then you do a kind of Google Maps pinch to zoom into the system boundary, and you drop down to level two. Level two is containers. Uh, this has nothing to do with Docker. There's an unfortunate clash of naming here. Feel free to ask me afterwards. But by container, I basically mean an application or a data store. So a front-end web app running in a web browser, a server-side web app, um, uh, a mobile app, uh, c -sharp Windows Service, a data store, an Amazon S3 bucket, et cetera. So it's a, a, an application or a data store. And then you progressively zoom in to get more detail. That's the essence of the C4 model. And the concept here is diagrams as maps. So sometimes you do want to tell different stories of different types of people. Sometimes those stories are very detailed, very technical. And other times they're very high level, which are good for lots of different audiences, of course. So in order to do this talk, I need to uh, go through C4 very, very quickly. So I'm going to give you a quick explanation of the, two, the, the top two level diagrams, the system context diagram and the container diagram. So the system context diagram basically starts with the box in the middle representing your system, the thing that you want to describe. And in order to draw a system context diagram, you need to answer these questions. What's the scope of the thing we are building? So what functionality, what responsibilities fits inside our system boundaries? and what sits outside of our system boundaries. Who is using our system? So who are the users, the roles, the actors, the personas, the real people who have some interaction with the thing we're building? And what system integration points do we need to provide? So you ask and answer these questions, and you can draft up a system context diagram. So this is a nice uh, example that somebody drew in a workshop a while back. This red box here, the financial risk system box, that's the system that they were designing, and therefore the system that they are describing. They have identified two different user types. There's two different business users who can do different things. And these boxes around the outside are the system integration points. 
So that's a really nice example of a system context diagram. And there's a little diagram key in the top right corner, et cetera, et cetera. Now we can zoom into that red box and we can drop down to level two. Level two is a container diagram. And a container diagram, in order to draw that, you have to answer this set of questions. So what are the major technology building blocks that we are using to assemble and build our software system? What are the responsibilities of those building blocks? And how do these building blocks, which I'm calling containers, how do they communicate at runtime? Ask those questions and you can draw a container diagram. So the red outline here represents the red box from the previous diagram. And all we're doing is we're zooming into the contents of that software system, that red box. And here we can see there are a bunch of data stores. We've got a bunch of Java command line apps and um, some JavaScript and a Spring app there. So that's, in essence, the, the C4 model at the top two levels of detail. The C4 model itself is notation independent. So uh, many people use boxes and arrows in different colors, different shapes. But you could use UML if you want to combine UML with something like the C4 model. The C4 model is essentially two things. It's a set of abstractions and a set of hierarchical diagram types. That's it. And the concept here is that a common set of abstractions is much more useful than a common notation. So where UML gives you both of these things, the C4 model basically says, here's a set of abstractions, and these are what you should use to communicate within your team. And there's a really good example of this in the real world, and it's a map. If we get two maps of Barcelona, put them side by side, they're going to show the same things, aren't they? The train stations, the metro routes, the bus routes, the tram routes, all of the tourist hotspots, et cetera, et cetera. The two maps will look different, different colors, different line styles, different notations but they're going to show the same abstractions, the same things. How do we decipher and understand a map? There's a key, there's a legend. So a real-world map is a nice example of a self-describing diagram, a self-describing picture. So tooling, that's what we're here to talk about. Um, what tooling do I recommend for drawing the C4 model diagrams? Most teams out there still seem to be using general-purpose diagramming tools, by which I mean Visio, Lucidchart, Diagrams.net, Draw.io, Gliffy, et cetera, et cetera. So because the, there's nothing special about the C4 diagrams from a notational perspective, you can use these tools to draw the C4 model diagrams. But I don't recommend doing that. So those general purpose diagramming tools that we all know and love, and these are fantastic tools, don't get me wrong, but these tools I do not recommend for drawing software architecture diagrams, specifically if you're going to use the C4 model approach. Why? They let you do anything you want to. So a general purpose diagramming tool does not know what you're trying to achieve, and it can't help you. So with a system context diagram, a system context diagram should really have two things on it, people and software systems. When you're using a general purpose diagramming tool like Visio, it's very easy to add a component onto a system context diagram. And this doesn't really make sense given the small number of rules that fit into the C4 model. So that's the first thing these tools can't help you with. If you try and export these things to a text-based format to check them into source code control, you'll often see that content and presentation is very mixed and jumbled up together. So this means you can't easily change the color of all software systems to be something else in your tooling. You have to work hard to do that. There's no model, there's no consistency. So one of the things you'll notice if you adopt C4 is that when you draw a system context to diagram, you have your users and your software systems. When you then draw something like a container diagram, you still need to include many of those same users and software systems. And that sounds very straightforward, but if you look here, we've renamed the business user to report viewer. So is this the same person or is it a different person? Have we just made a mistake here? And of course, this is a relatively easy problem to solve. We just find where we've renamed it and make sure we do rename it everywhere. But what happens if you've got 10 or 20 different diagrams? So this consistency problem becomes much, much more complicated. These formats are hard to diff. If you've ever exported like a Visio file or a diagrams.net file to XML, you just get this. I have no idea what the change was. Whoever made this change, you stick in a pull request. It's just impossible to diff these things. You can't automate many of these tools. So with diagrams.net, you can, you can pass it a CSV file, and you can do some limited automation in terms of diagram generation. But that's really it. You can't you know, automate Visio to draw your diagram for you, for example. And these things take a really long time to build. When I was putting these slides together, I wanted to draw some diagrams. And what you'll notice, maybe, is that that line's not straight. It's one pixel out at the bottom. It's really annoying. 
And this is why we spend so much time making diagrams that look nice, and then somebody comes along and says, oh, that label's wrong, and then you type the label, and the, the thing moves one pixel the other way, and like, oh, come on, really? So I just want to remove all of this stress from my life, and I just want to draw nice architecture diagrams quickly. So back in October 2020, the ThoughtWorks tech radar pinged diagrams as code as a concept. There are a bunch of tools out there, including the one I'm going to talk about, to about today. The most popular are really Plant, UML, and Mermaid. So Plant, UML, and Mermaid, instead of drawing diagrams with a, a keyboard and a mouse and a tool, a kind of graphical tool, you type some text in a domain-specific language. You pass that text through the tooling, and the tooling creates you a diagram automatically. Why is Diagrams as Code good? It's easy to author because it's just text. As software developers, we like text. We have lots of IDEs and text editors that we generally like. We can pop these things into version control very easily because they're text. Because they're text in a domain-specific language, we can diff different versions of files. So we can say, oh, that's the change you made to the diagrams. We can include these things in pull requests, and we've got lots of collaboration tools. In addition, many of these diagrams as code tools can be automated. And you'll see teams who are integrating these tools into uh, CI, CD, and build pipelines so that they're automatically generating diagrams every time somebody commits a change. And this is super, super powerful. So Plant UML is a, is a kind of UML focused but actually quite general purpose diagrams as code tool. There is an extension called C4 Plant UML, which basically gives you a set of macros that you include in your Plant UML file. And that allows you to talk about things like person and software system. So Plant UML often lets you talk about components and rectangles and arrows. The C4 Plant UML gives you a little bit of a domain specific language kind of focused on the C4 model. So this little bit of text here will generate you that little diagram there. The problem with C4 Plant UML and specifically Plant UML and Mermaids and these other tools, of course, is that if you want to draw two diagrams, you have to create two text files. If you're copying elements and relationships between your diagrams, you have to make sure that those things are in both text files. If you rename the element, you have to make sure you rename it in both text files. Now, things like Plant UML can do includes, so you can pop common elements into a shared file and include them, but that often doesn't work for a bunch of complicated reasons. So fundamentally, if you want two diagrams, you have two text files. If you change something, you have to make sure it's changed everywhere. Now, of course, as developers, we do have global search to replace tools, so this does make our life easier, but the responsibility for you to keep these two diagrams up to date is on you. And I want to flip the narrative. I want to get us away as an industry from diagramming towards modeling or really back towards modeling. So for those of you who are a little bit old like myself, um, 20 years ago, we used to do lots of modeling with big bloated UML tools, rational rows, et cetera, et cetera. The concept of modeling has disappeared. When I say modeling, people go, oh, that's horrible. We don't want to do modeling. We just want to draw some nice diagrams. This talk should really be called models as code, but people don't want to do modeling. So that's what I'm here to change. So when the lockdown happened, so most of my kind of income is, is from me flying around the world and teaching organizations and teams how to adopt the C4 model. When the pandemic hit, all my work stopped, like instantly stopped. So I had a bunch of time on my hands, and there's only so much surfing and coffee that I can make. So I decided to put some time and effort into making a bunch of tooling. And that's what I'm here to talk you to about today. And all of this tooling really fits under the structure as um, umbrella. And uh, everything I'm going to show you today is free and or open source. I do have some paid and commercial options, but I'm not going to show you any of that stuff at all. So this is all just the free stuff that you can use when you leave this session. So the first of these tools is called the Structurized DSL, the Structurized Domain Specific Language. And this, like Plant UML, is a text-based domain specific language, but it's specifically targeted towards creating software architecture diagrams with the C4 model. This is on GitHub. And this is actually a wrapper for another library that I built uh, six or seven years ago called Structurizer for Java. And I'm going to come back to why that might be important later. So I'm calling this Diagrams as Code 2. So with Diagrams as Code 1, if you need two diagrams, you create two text files. With Diagrams as Code 1, uh, sorry, with Diagrams as Code 2, I want to move from diagramming back to modeling. And what I want to be able to do here is to craft up one text file and generate all of my diagrams automatically. The benefit of this, of course, is my, my single text file has all, my, all of my definitions of my elements and relationships. 
And if I change the name of an element, I can change it once, and that change is reflected across all my diagrams because the tooling's doing the work for me. So yeah, this really should be called Models as Code, but that's not really a catchy title and no one would turn up. So what's the key difference between this approach and something like PlantUML? Well, the first big one is really domain concepts. So with Mermaid and PlantUML, you're talking about boxes and arrows. And you'll see this with raw plant UML. You know, if you want to draw a diagram, you might say, oh, I'd like a rectangle and a rectangle and a line between the two rectangles. And plant UML here doesn't know that you're drawing an architecture diagram. So there are no rules, there are no guidance, it can't help you. C4 plant UML gives you a domain specific language. So now we're talking about persons and systems, but it can't help you as far as modeling goes. You know, there are no rules built into C4 plant UML that say things like, don't put components on a system context diagram because it doesn't really care. So the Structurizer DSL is a much more domain-focused, domain-specific language for the C4 model. And yeah, we're talking about person and software system, but there's a whole bunch more stuff that we can do here because there's a set of rules and a meta model that sit underneath this that, that give you some, some guidance, essentially. So I'm going to drop into a demo. and. For the demo, I'm going to be using some other tool uh, I've built called Structurizer Lite. So Structurizer Lite is a free version of my Structurizer tooling. Uh, it's historically, so from, from last year, this is when the, uh, the tooling was first created, it's historically been shipped as a Docker image on Docker Hub. Uh, last week, I have now deployed, oh sorry, I, I've now released a Spring Boot version. So if you don't like Docker or you can't use Docker in your organization, uh, there's kind of a raw Spring Boot version that you can use as well. So Structurizer Lite is uh, it's a Docker image. All I'm going to do here is I'm going to start up the Docker container. I'm going to do a port map, and I'm going to mount a volume to slash user local Structurizer. That volume is essentially going to be a folder on my local laptop that has a Structurizer DSL file in it called workspace.dsl. So if I show you my desktop, I'm going to create on here a uh, JBCN folder, which doesn't exist. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start up Lite with uh, the full path, because Docker prefers that, JBCN. Hopefully this will work. So wait for this to start up. So the start Structurizer Lite has started up. If we go back here, we now have a JBCN folder. And because this didn't exist before, it's created us a kind of default starting point uh, Structurizer DSL file called workspace.dsl. If I open this up, essentially what we have here, so all we're doing is we're defining a workspace. A workspace is really nothing more than a wrapper for two things. Number one, a model, and number two, a set of views. So the model basically defines all of the elements. So in here, in this case, we are defining a person and we're defining a software system. And we're also defining a relationship between the user and the software system. So that's all we're doing here. That's our model. And we are defining a single system context view. So what this is doing is it's saying, I'd like a C4 system context view for the software system. Include star basically says it includes the software system and includes things that have a relationship to or from that software system. So there's some, some magic we can do there and apply automatic layout. So if I go to my web browser and I go to the Structurizer Lite page, so you should always agree the T's and C's, of course. <laughs> so this is Structurizer Lite. It's a little um, web-based diagram editor, and what we can see here is the user talking to the software system. I can tell you're absolutely amazed by this. All of this worked for like two boxes on a uh, on on a web page, but let's do something a little bit more interesting. So. First of all, I'm not a fan of automatic layout. So there are some automatic layout algorithms built into this, but I'm not a fan. So if you are, like me, not a fan of automatic layout, you can comment out that line, go back here, refresh your browser, and now we can do things like change the page size, or can we move boxes around, and we can break the line and add vertices and all that sort of stuff. You'll see the little Save Workspace button in the top right um, was kind of automatically clicked then. If I go back here and I rename this to Simon and go back here, 
it knows that I've just renamed that thing. So there's, an, uh, there's a kind of merging algorithm that's built into, tool, into this tooling that will try and figure out which elements you renamed and where that new element sits on the diagram. If you're now wondering, well, hang on a second, where are these diagram coordinates being stored? The answer is there's another file in here called workspace.json. And this is essentially the canonical data storage structure of the Structurizer tooling. So this is just a JSON version of what is generated from that workspace.dsl file. It's got the relationship in here and the elements. And somewhere down here, we can see the x, y coordinates for all of the elements. So what many people do is they take this folder that's just been created. They check that whole folder into source code control along with the script to boot up the Structurizer like tooling. And now anybody on the development team can boot this thing up and they can see the diagrams, modify the file, the diagrams, check them back in. So that's kind of the, the general workflow that teams like to use. So let's go this back down. Let's uh, re-enable auto layout. And we'll do left, right. We'll go back here, click refresh. So there's our diagram back again. So imagine that's our context diagram for the system that we are creating. Now let's imagine we want to do the pinch to zoom in and draw a container diagram. With plant UML, you now create a separate text file. With the Structurizer DSL, what you do is you open up a set of curly braces. And let's say we're going to have a web app, and that's going to be a container uh, labeled web app. Oops. And we're going to have a database, which is also going to be a C4 model container named database. So if I save this and refresh, what do you think is going to happen? There's some people saying nothing, and that's the correct answer. So what we've done here is we've added things into our model, but we've not created a view to show those things from our model. So what we need to do is we need to create a container view. How do we create a container view? We can copy this, change this to container. We can change diagram. Uh, this is just a key. So what we're going to do now is create a container diagram for our software system. This is going to include all the containers inside that software system, so the web app and the database, and include things that are linked to them. So if we save this, refresh the browser, now what we can do is we can double click this thing, and we can zoom into the, the inside of that software system. But we're missing all of our relationships because we haven't defined those things in the model. So let's do that. Let's imagine that we want the web app to talk to the database. And that can be reads from and writes to. And let's imagine we want to replicate this user relationship here. So we're going to say the user has a link to the web app also with the word users. If I go back and refresh, now we've got our context diagram and our container diagram, which is the user using the web app, web app using the database. One of the things we talk about in software development is dry, isn't it? Don't repeat yourself. But that's exactly what I've done here. I've basically got the same line twice with the same relationship between two different elements. So how do I fix that problem? The answer is delete that one. So now if I save it and go back and refresh, we still have our context diagram as before and our container diagram, but I've only created one relationship between the user and the web application in this case. And what's happened is we've defined this one here. And because the web application sits inside the software system, this tooling has basically figured out, oh, the relationship between the user and the software system itself is missing. So I'm going to imply that that exists and create it automatically for you. So this is called implied relationships. And there's a whole bunch of things you can do. You can turn this off completely, or you can customize it through a bunch of mechanisms that I'll talk about later. So that's a, a nice kind of feature that allows you to trim down the number of relationships that you need to craft up in your DSL files. Who likes the gray boxes? Answer, nobody. So let's fix the gray boxes thing. So how do you, how do you make some styles? One of the simplest things you can do is uh, that this tool has the support for things like themes. We can say, add the default theme. Save that, go back here. And this is going to use the, uh, the kind of blue uh, colors and the shapes that you'll see on the c4model.com website, uh, assuming that my internet connection works and it can talk to the, uh, the servers. There we go. So now we've got different colors. I don't know why the automatic layout fell there, but it did for some reason, probably because it can't get to the internet. So let's take the theme off. And we'll go back here and we'll refresh. So now we've got our boring gray boxes back. Let's imagine we want to change this Simon box, this person, to a, uh, a kind of user or person shape. How do we do that? Well, it turns out 
if we uh, enable tooltips, every element and every relationship has a set of tags. So this person box has an elements tag and a person tag, and the software system box has an elements tag and a software system tag. So for those of you who've done any web development, this is basically like CSS classes. So what we can do is we can essentially create a bunch of styles. I'm going to create an element style for the person tag. And we're going to say shape person. I'm going to save that, refresh. And now we've just changed the shape of that user to a person. And of course, that's done across all of our diagrams now. If we want to add some color, it's more or less like CSS. So we can say, let's add a background of dark red and a foreground of white. Again, go there, refresh, and we're done. So how do we change the shape of this database to like be a database shape, like a cylinder? Well, if we look at the tags for this, it has an elements tag and a container tag. The web application also has an elements tag and a container tag. So we're going to need to add our own tag to say, we want this thing to be a database. So how do we do that? We can go to the database here, open up a set of curly braces, tags, database, save that, go back here, refresh, enable tooltips. Now we can see there's a database tag on the tooltip. And now it's really just the same thing as before. We need to create an element style or the database tag, and we want to change the shape to be a cylinder. Go back, refresh, and that's it. So it's a, a really nice kind of simple way to uh, start changing shapes, colors. You can modify line styles uh, for the relationships. You can uh, change font sizes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the notation's kind of taken care for you, uh, but you do have some control over some of the aesthetics, uh, so the shapes and colors and border styles of those items. Quick tour of Structurizer Lite, um, very, very briefly. So one of the things I'm a big proponent of is that architecture diagrams have a diagram key, a diagram legend. This tooling will create one for you. So it looks at all of the tags that are existing in the model, and it looks at the tags that you define element styles for, and it does some merging, and it basically creates your diagram key automatically. So that's a thing that's taken away from your hands. If you want to do things like exporting to PNG files, there's a, a PNG export that's available for you. This is like a 300 DPI export. The diagram key is also exportable, and you can crop it, and there's a bunch of stuff you can do there. There's an SVG export if you want to get a bit more fancy, and there's a, a bunch of ways you can plug in event handlers. So when a, a, an element is double-clicked, you can find the next level down and zoom to it, for example. And there's a full screen mode and et cetera, et cetera. So that's the, the kind of basics of Structurizer DSL and Structurizer Lite. It's a model-based approach to creating software architecture diagrams. And uh, this free Structurizer Lite application gives you a way to, to view those things. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to shut down this thing here. And I'm going to boot up Structurizer Lite with another example I have to show you a couple of other features very, very quickly. And then I'm going to talk about one of the complicated questions with diagramming, which is, well, how do you make this diagramming approach work for big, complicated systems? Because it's easy when you've got six or seven or 10 boxes on, on a diagram, but what happens when you have more? So let's boot up Structurizer Lite again. I'm going to go to uh, Lycos 8080. And this is going to boot up a different example. So this is uh, a little example you can find. Again, this example is all on GitHub. And it's basically a, a set of diagrams and documentation for a fictional financial risk system. So what we have here is the documentation renderer, the documentation viewer. And in the documentation, you can actually embed the live diagrams with the diagram keys in them. So this is a really nice way, if you have a bunch of documentation, um, you can include that thing. So if you're doing diagrams as code, you might want to think about doing something like docs as code as well. Where does this documentation come from? Again, if I go back to my desktop, we can drill down to this. So the workspace DSL file for this example um, is the same as before. Here we're creating a financial risk system. Uh, it's a software system with the, the, the name financial risk system. And we're saying exclamation mark docs, docs. So what this is doing is basically saying, go and attach all of the documentation in the docs folder and render it through Structurizer Lite. What does the docs folder look like? It's all Markdown and ASCII doc. So if you have a folder full of Markdown or ASCII files that you want to um, be your supplementary documentation to describe a system you are building, this is a really nice way to do that. And this is just bog standard Markdown, with the exception of this little embed tag here, which basically says embed the context diagram that's defined as a part of this workspace. 
And this is all full text searchable. Uh, and there's a quick find feature. So there's a whole bunch of stuff you can do with the diagram renderer. Who's using architecture decision records? Anybody? Awesome, a few people. So architecture decision records are a fabulous way to capture the decisions you're making when you're doing things like design, uh, refactoring, and so on. What I've done here is I've also said uh, exclamation mark ADRs, ADRs, which basically says go and attach all of the architecture decision records in that ADRs folder and make them viewable as well. The ADRs are sitting here. And again, this is all just bog standard ADR markdown files. These were created with Nat Price's ADR tools, command line tool. And the Structurizer Light Renderer will render those in a nice little web based view for you. So you get a summary with all the statuses. Uh, and you can zoom through and you can click through the, the, the uh, decisions, et cetera, et cetera. Again, all full text searchable. If, you, if you're using ADRs and you're deprecating ADRs or you're superseding ADRs or you're linking between ADRs, uh, this tooling supports those links automatically. And I built this cool little graph feature which will show you how these things are interacting. So if you've got a bunch of ADRs, like 100 different ADRs uh, that represent the decisions you're making on your project, you can visualize them with this graph, and you can really cool kind of see the, the change of decisions throughout your project lifecycle, which is quite nice. So that's um, diagrams, documentation, and decisions that are all part of this tooling as well. So let me shut down Structurizer Lite and boot it up with yet another example. So I'm going to show you the example diagrams that you can find on the c4model.com website. And this is a set of diagrams, a set of C4 diagrams for a fictional internet banking system. So I'm going to go back here. I'm going to go to Structurizer Lite. And we're going to see a different set of diagrams. So this is a system landscape diagram for uh, a bank. We can double click, get a system context diagram, double click, get a container diagram, et cetera, et cetera. It's all the same things we've seen already. So this is my Structurizer Lite tooling. One of the things about the Structurizer DSL is that it's rendering tool agnostic. So you don't have to use my tooling to visualize these diagrams. You can use somebody else's tooling if you want to. And there's another tool that somebody created recently called C4Viz. C4Viz is another kind of Docker-based tool. Uh, it has a whole bunch of arguments here, but basically we're going to use the same thing. We're going to boot up the C4Viz tooling against that big bank folder that has the workspace DSL file in it. Um, let me see if I can just go back. That's probably easier. And this will start up on another port on my laptop, port 9000. So this is a, a Spring Boot app. If I go here, open a new tab, go to C4Viz. So this is now rendering the same views in the same workspace, but it's using a different tool. This is actually what it's doing here is it's converting the views in the, in the Structurizer DSL workspace to C4 plant UML format. And it's using the plant UML renderer to render those things server side and then present them in the browser here. And again, this is also interactive. So uh, the person who wrote this tooling allows you to click a box. Oh, there we go, broken. I think it's because my, my uh, laptop doesn't have an internet connection, so it's not rendering the, um, the includes. But essentially, it's doing the same thing. It's allowing you to, to create a, um, a hierarchical set of diagrams, which is quite nice. So that's the, the kind of um, oh, one of the options for, for tooling. Uh, let's see if my internet connection does work. It does. It just must be planting the miles down. If I go to the big bank example, so there's a demo page. You can go to structurize.com slash DSL. And there are a bunch of examples linked at the bottom here. So this is the workspace for the, uh, the big bank example I've just showed you. There are a bunch of export formats that I've built. So there's something else called the Structurizer CLI. This is a command line interface tool. It's all written in Java. It's all on GitHub. Uh, if you go to github.com slash structurizer slash CLI, you'll find that there. And I've, I've basically created a bunch of exports for tools like PlantUML. So you can craft up your software architecture workspace in the Structurizer DSL, run the CLI, convert those views to PlantUML format, and then you have these PlantUML diagrams. There is a C4 PlantUML version. Again, these are all automatically created for you. There is a Mermaid version. So a Mermaid's particularly interesting at the moment because GitHub just started supporting Mermaid files in uh, GitHub readmes and, and Markdown. So again, you can use all this tooling to craft up your Mermaid definitions uh, via the CLI and the DSL and get those definitions and include them. If you like the dot format for graphics, there's a kind of raw dot format. And if you have dynamic diagrams, uh, you're able to export those to the web sequence diagrams format as well. So 
in essence, there's a CLI tool and there's a bunch of export formats that have also uh, been created and are available for use. And of course, you can extend and fork and add your own export formats if you want to. Uh, one more thing to show you then. Uh, the concept of themes is quite nice because themes can also have icons. So what I've done is I've built a bunch of themes for Azure, GCP, Kubernetes, and Amazon Web Services. And there's an Amazon Web Services example on the Structurizer uh, DSL demo page. And what this essentially does is it allows you to use things like the Amazon icons on your C4 model uh, deployment diagrams. And again, the diagram key is automatically created for you. So one of the big problems with the Amazon icon sets, of course, is that nobody knows what the icons mean, because there are so many icons. So what this does is it, it allows you to, to tag up specific elements. The tags are associated with icons, and you get the icons described in the diagram key, which is quite nice. So again, that's um, a kind of brief summary of that stuff. Let me shut down c 4 Viz and let me shut down Structurizer Lite. And let me show you a final example. Uh, which will answer the question, well, how does this work in the real world? If I have a big system, like, how do I draw diagrams of that complicated system? So I'm going to boot Structurizer Lite up one more time, open up yet another tab, go to localhost 8080. And let's imagine we have something like a microservices architecture. So maybe in this microservices architecture, we have a web application here, a C4 model container. And we, we, are, we have a bunch of services. And every service is a, uh, it's a combination of an API talking to an individual database of some description. So here we have eight different services. I've color coded all of them. This diagram kind of works, but imagine this wasn't eight services. Imagine it was 18 services, or 30 services, or 50 services. You'd start to see that this diagram would become quite complicated very, very quickly. So how do you make this approach work when you've got bigger, more complicated software systems? You have three options. Option one, rather than create one diagram showing all services, maybe you create one diagram per service. So here we have a container diagram for that same software system. We're showing the web application. We're showing service one. And we're showing things connected into and out from service one. So we're showing like a partition, a small slice, a subset of the overall software architecture. And then we can rinse and repeat and do the same thing for service two, for example. So here we're showing service two, which is an API and a database, things coming into service two, and things coming out of service two. How does this work? How am I getting all these different diagrams? Again, if we go back to my desktop and drill into the examples, this example is a little bit uh, more complicated. There's a bunch of stuff that you can do with the DSL, including includes and a workspace extension. So what we're doing here is we're including this model.dsl file. The model.dsl file is essentially a description of the model. So it's the user, the software system, the web app, and all of the services. And the service is basically just an API and a database. Um, and then the, the workspace itself is the one creating all the views. So this is the diagram showing all services. We're basically show, saying, create me a container view for the software system and include everything, include star. The, the service one is basically saying include the user, include service one, in, include things coming into service one and things coming out of service one. And the service two diagram is exactly the same. So if I wanted to create a service three version of this, copy paste, change two to three, two to three, refresh, go back here. And now we have our service three diagram created for us. So this is, again, a really nice way to describe a whole bunch of different views on top of the same model. If I rename service three to something else, that change is now applicable across all of my different diagrams. So option one, don't create a single diagram, create lots of smaller diagrams. The trade-off of this approach, of course, is you miss the bigger picture. And some people like having that bigger picture. So option two is to not use a traditional boxes and arrows diagram. It's to use a different visualization. And the first of these I'm going to show you is built into the Structurizer Lite tooling. And in this case, it's a, a force directed graph. So this is showing you the same thing as before. It's showing you the same data as before, but showing you in a much more succinct and concise format. And this is interactive. We can start clicking things, and it will show us things that are linked to the thing we've clicked on. 
There's, again, it's uh, searchable. So we can say, I'm interested in Service 5 API, and it goes and finds that thing on here. We can drag things around. We've got tooltips. We can embed more metadata on these elements. So there's a whole bunch of really interesting things you can do with these graph visualizations. This is a much better way to showcase larger amounts of data. So that's option two. Use something like a graph. Option three is to use another piece of tooling, um, which is, is not my tooling. It's a, a, a tool called Elograph or Ilograph. I'm not really sure how you pronounce it. So I'm going to show you quickly the Structurizer CLI. The Structurizer CLI is a, a Java app. It's available as a kind of raw Java da download or a Docker container. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to start the Structurizer CLI. I'm going to say that we want to export the views. In, or in this case, we want to export the, the, the data that's contained in the workspace. The workspace we're going to export is uh, the thing I've just showed you. It's the, the workspace.dsl file. And I want to export to Ilograph format. So if we do this, it's going to create a new file. So we can open this file up. And this is an Ilograph or Ilograph definition. And this is a rather horrible YAML syntax. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy it, this into my clipboard. I'm going to open a new tab. I'm going to go to app.ilograph.com. I'm going to click a new diagram, copy my version in, click static structure. And now what we have is basically an Ilograph export of exactly the same data I showed you before. So we have the web application here, the service APIs, and the service databases. And this is really another interesting tool because it's interactive. So now we can start zooming around. If we're interested in service 6 API, we can click that thing that kind of zooms straight in. So again, this is really not, uh, it's another tool that we can use to showcase, explore, and visualize larger amounts of data. So if you're building a microservices architecture, a message-driven architecture, an event-driven architecture, you know, something of a distributed nature, tooling like this is another way to create your architecture diagrams. Rather than static PNG files you'll stick in a confluence page, you have some sort of link to these things uh, because they're interactive. So that's option three. Again, use another alternative format. And this Ilograph export format is built into my uh, open source CLI tooling. So that's the, the, the demo, basically. I've showed you uh, the structure of the DSL, how it's model based, how we can apply styling. We can export the views to different formats, and we can use different rendering tools, et cetera, et cetera, depending on our needs. So let me go back to the slides. So the slides will be available. And there's a bunch of uh, slides in there to show you all the things that we've demoed few slides just to finish off. So what I see here is teams are kind of adopting this approach. And they're like, how can we make this work across many teams? So how do we do something like enterprise-wide modeling? What you can do is you can define your software systems and your people in a kind of system landscape workspace. And then you can use the Structurizer workspace extension feature to create a C4 model drill down for every software system included on that landscape diagram. So this is one mechanism that allows you to reuse uh, definitions of software systems and people across different teams. And you can check all these in things into source code control and integrate it with your build process, et cetera, et cetera. I added support for JSR223, which is the Java scripting API. So what this allows you to do is it allows you to write scripts in Groovy, Kotlin, and JRuby, and also JavaScript if you're using one of the earlier JVMs that supports the Rhino engine. And you can do some quite um, interesting thing. So if you don't define any views in your Structurizer workspace.dsl file, the tooling will create some views for you. And those views will be created with automatic layout enabled by default. If you don't like that functionality, what you can do is you can write up a quick Groovy script and basically say, create the default set of views and walk across all of them and disable automatic layout. This is possible because the Structurizer DSL is basically a very thin wrapper on top of the Structurizer for Java library, which I built six or seven years ago. So the, the JSR223 scripting API allows us to get access to all of the underlying language features. There's also support for plugins. So you can uh, craft up a little project. You can add a, a Maven dependency or Gradle dependency on the Structurizer DSL. There's a, a very small interface you can define. Pop that into your, into your class path, and there's a bunch of ways you can do that. And this allows you to write some plugins that were called when your DSL file is parsed. Why might you want to do that? The scripting thing is useful. You can uh, write scripts in line. If you've got short scripts, you can also call out to script files. But if you want to do something a bit more complicated, maybe you want to parse a Terraform definition or a cloud formation definition with a bunch of Java code, and use that definition to populate your C4 model deployment diagram. Uh, that might be something you want to do with uh, lots of Java code, for example. 
You might want to use both of these approaches. So you might want to take a kind of hybrid approach. Maybe you want to define a DSL file like this. So maybe you have a high-level DSL file that defines your software systems and your containers. So here we have a web application with the title web application. And then maybe we want to write some Java code to uh, automatically use Java's reflection mechanism to go and identify components in a real production code base and insert those into the web application as components. So what we can do here is we can um, write a little project. We can add a link to the uh, DSL parser against all of Maven Central. We can parse the workspace.dsl file, get the workspace out of that, go and find the web application, write some code to go find components, and then add those things into our model, and then craft up a bunch of component views based upon that information. So there's a, way, a bunch of ways you can use this tooling in a kind of hybrid approach. In terms of use of scenarios, most people are really handcrafting the models. So my standard advice for using C4 is focus on levels one and two, so the system context diagrams and the container diagrams. That's where you get a lot of value for the effort. Um, and in those cases, it makes sense to handcraft those DSL files because that information is not readily findable in the code base. Diagrams as data is kind of what I've just described. If you have cloud formation scripts or Terraform scripts, or you want to use Java's reflection mechanism to go and identify components in a code base and use that to populate your model automatically as a part of your build process, uh, the tooling allows you to do that as well. Most people are still using static diagrams, so you can use this tooling. You can build up your own tool chain to export static diagrams as PNG files, whether that's with Structurizer Lite or whether you use like a plant UML um, export, up to you. But I'm a big fan of the interactive diagrams. So docs as code, diagrams as code, check these things in source code control along with the script to boot up something like Structurizer Lite or C4Viz, and then you have those interactive diagrams available when people need them. Some closing thoughts. Diagrams as code is awesome. It's text-based. It's easy to author. We've got lots of tooling to support text. It's very automatable. And it's interesting because now we can start to automatically generate parts of our diagrams based upon our real running production infrastructure or our real running production code. That's something you can't do with uh, general purpose diagramming tools such as Visio, for example. Diagrams as code 2, my structurizer DSL, makes this model base. It takes it one step further. And it allows us to separate content from presentation. So the DSL file allows you to craft up your model and define a bunch of views. But the tooling itself is, tool, is rendering tool agnostic. So you can build your own rendering engine to render these diagrams in any visualization format that you want to, which is quite nice. And really, once you start thinking about this, your diagrams are just disposable artifacts. The diagrams are something that you can craft up when you need them. And of course, when we're creating diagrams with Visio, because we spend so long crafting up diagrams in Visio, we get attached to them. And when somebody says, no, your diagram's wrong, please change it, you're like, no, I don't want to change my diagram because it took me so long to create. So this tooling helps with that problem. The caveat with all this tooling is because it's as code, it's text-based, you're kind of excluding non-developers. The Structurized DSL is not super complicated because it does focus on the terminology used by the C4 model but there is definitely an emphasis and bias towards a developer audience here. So that may or may not affect your choice of tooling. My recommendation is create all of the stuff as text, stick it next to source code control, and then when you're making pull requests, include your diagram and documentation changes in your pull requests at the same time you are making your uh, feature changes. If you need to publish your diagrams and documentation to a wider non-developer audience who don't have access to your source code control system, then use the publishing tools, generate um, static HTML microsites. There are a bunch of projects you can find on GitHub that will take all of this stuff and export it to a HTML microsite. So you can publish and host these things on other platforms if you want to later. And people ask me, is this tooling useful for upfront design or long-lived documentation? When I'm doing upfront design, I'm still going to use whiteboards and pieces of paper. For me, this tooling really shines for longer-lived design, where we want to take something make it look nice, and make changes to it in the future. If you think this is useful and you want to go test it out, you can go to the DSL repo on GitHub, and there's a little cookbook that I've started creating, which gives you a bunch of recipes like how do I create a system context diagram. I've just got some uh, um, interactive examples. And if you want to try this tooling out without installing anything, you can go to structurize.com slash DSL, and you get a little demo page I briefly showed you text box on the left, diagrams on the right, and allows you to, to kind of click through the different export formats and try the tooling out. And that 
is that. Thank you very much. I think because there's a long break, if anyone has questions, feel free. Otherwise, coffee awaits, I imagine. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, okay. Uh, we are using a Structurizer uh, as part of our CI/CD pipeline. Okay. We are, we have all the content checked in GitHub, uh, and I am giving my developers the capability of modifying or tuning the diagrams, especially the level three diagrams uh, have a lot of uh, components in the view. So in reality, they are not using auto layout. They are modif yeah. uh, They are setting the layout uh, manually. Uh, most of the changes, uh, well, they are adding new components, they, they, this is mostly under control. So when they update the diagram uh, and they publish a pull request uh, to GitHub, it's quite hard to understand the visual changes that they have done on the model, okay, on the JSON file. Yeah, yeah. Is there any way or planned way to have a tool or some, uh, something that we can use to really have a diff on the changes that are being published as part of these diagrams? Uh, so n n nothing planned. I mean, it's it's potentially possible to build like a, a visual diff engine where you, you create a PNG snapshot of one and the other, mm -hmm. um, and, and then you kind of view those things side by side. Uh, but there's, there, yeah, there's, there's no tool planned yet, I'm mm -hmm. afraid. Okay. Okay, thank you. There's a question at the front here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Making you walk now. Uh, Hi. Hi. Uh, Thank you for the speech. Uh, just uh, a stupid question. Uh, <laughs> is it possible to um, to put the relationship of uh, relation database? I mean, uh, the, um, the typical table and relationships with uh, table and keys and foreigns and this stuff? No, so the, the, the C4 model really focuses, it really focuses on uh, software architecture. Okay. And if you want to do things like entity relationship diagrams, then you should um, probably use existing tooling for doing that. So yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd lean on existing tooling and notations to do that. But that's not something covered by this tooling. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other question? <laughs> um, as a general rule of thumb, how detailed you, you suggest that a modeling diagram should have, so all the way to the component and all the way down, or would you say abstract it up to this particular point so that it's clear for audience what they're looking at? So it, it's a really good question. My, my kind of starting advice is uh, use level one, so system context diagram, and use level two, the container diagram. If you're building something like a small monolithic application, you might find it useful to drop down to level three and show components inside that monolithic application. If you have a, like a really large uh, kind of legacy existing monolithic application, you might be better trying to automatically generate the level three component diagram. The, one of the big problems with auto automatic generation is if your code base is a little bit of a mess, mm. you're going to get a really messy diagram and it's not going to show you what you think your system looks like. Mm -hmm. and, and what you find here is you often have to clean up the code in order to get a good diagram. And then you don't need the diagram because you've got nice clean code. Yeah. So that's why I, I, I kind of advocate and recommend levels one and two. Yeah. If you're building something like a microservices architecture, so imagine you're one team and you're building a, a system made up of a bunch of services or maybe a bunch of like AWS lambdas and serverless uh, things, yeah. then you might want to stop a level two because all of those individual services uh, and, and lambdas are going to be C4 model containers. So yeah, level one and two is, is generally my recommendation. Right. And then really think about the question, like how much value is level three going to give us given the effort we're going to need to craft it up? All right, thanks. You're welcome. There's another question on okay. the app. <laughs> uh, are all the examples shown available online, especially the one with eight services? The eight services example is not online, actually. So all of the others are on GitHub. You go to github.com slash structurizer slash examples. Uh, all of the examples are on there, but I'll, I'll add the services e example on there. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other question? Perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs>